Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and this is my review of X Factor number 17. And uh, I just have to say, uh, I think I might need to apologize to Cena Grace. So anyway, this is the True Believers. This is where they do reprints of, I don't know if you'd call this a classic issue. I wouldn't even call this early part of the Louis Simonson and Walt Simonson run a classic run. It really, it really got up to speed when they did Follow the Mutants like a year later, but... Man, for frickin' one dollar, definitely. Although I did have to laugh in that, um, this is the 1980s, so, you know, you couldn't just look something up on the internet. So, if it was set in San Francisco, uh, they would just be like, um, mountains, and then, like, there's a pointy building in there somewhere. <laughs> like, I've never seen less convincing. Typically, in movies and TV shows and comics, you set things in a couple of key areas because they have landmarks, you know, you see the Golden Gate Bridge or the Bay Bridge, you know it's, you know, San Francisco, you see the uh, Transamerica Building, which is this one, and then uh, they got the, uh, oh gosh, what is it, it's the new building that's taller than the Transamerica Building. Oh, I just had it on the tip of my tongue. It's, you know, it's, it's some tech company that owns like half the Bay Area. And uh, they've got their new building and it lights up. But it's not quite iconic looking. So I think still, you know, you, you know, whenever they do a, trans, or a, a well, Transformers movie, they'll be like, Transamerica building, uh, go, no, it'll be Golden Gate, Transamerica building, and then like the Bay Bridge. And you're like, oh, like even some normie like in Nebraska understands. Okay, so you don't have to say San Francisco. Um, so usually they do that, and uh, I guess I guess Walt Simonson didn't want to take the bus down to the library in 1987 to uh, uh, Xerox, you know, some pages of uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. So one of the things that I was thinking while reading this is that, um, you know, obviously if I read something that's good, the common thing is to recommend it. I know that probably sounded really condescending, <laughs> explaining how recommendations work. But I would almost say that if you haven't read a bunch of other X-Men comics from this era, like, you can't hand this book to a normie. It just it, it won't make sense. But having read a bunch of books and runs, you know, before and after this era, it actually filled out a lot of things like, um, uh, why am I forgetting the name of everything? Extinction Agenda, which I... <laughs> I'm going to the storage locker like next week and I'm going to try and find Extinction Agenda because I moved and then I moved and I moved again and I have it. I just don't know where it is. I know I know where it is. It's in, it's in the storage locker. So Cameron Hodge, I didn't really know anything about him. He just pops up as like this big villain for Extinction Agenda. It's like I, they're like, he used to be X Factor's um, PR consultant. I was like, so it was more than that. It was he was the leader of a um, uh, anti mutant group called the Right, and he was kind of you know trying to discredit mutants. So you get to see more of this. So uh, what this is is um, it's this whole era. Like I said, I didn't know very well. So X Factor started. Let me see if I can find the cover. All right, just uh, just kind of just sit there as I flip through the entire book trying to find the cover that I'm talking about. So it started as a way to bring back the original five X-Men. Uh, Jean Grey obviously had been gone since um, uh, Dark Phoenix saga and then in a very complicated uh, turn of events that even I can't properly recount uh, from memory, uh, John Byrne helped you know, establish that you know, it was actually a fake and then the real Jean Grey, and there was a cocoon in Jamaica Bay, which is not in Jamaica. <laughs> Sometimes Marvel uh, writers in the 70s and 80s would assume that everyone else lived in the New York City area, and they would know things like Jamaica Bay isn't in Jamaica. <laughs> Although I'm sure they have a Jamaica Bay in Jamaica. So anyway, they got the original crew back. So you're like, all right, cool. It's the original X-Men. They're called X-Factor. But then what they were were kind of like reverse Ghostbusters, I guess you'd call them. They call themselves the exterminators. They're like, if you spot a mutant, call us and we'll take care of them. But they would really rescue them and, and train them. Um, it was one of those bits that just really never took off. Even at like only issue 17, they were only a year and a half into the series. 
they had already basically just given up on it because it was weird. It was basically like, uh, it's it's uh, slaves, and we're gonna ca- we're gonna <laughs> advertise ourselves as capturing escaped slaves. It's like, uh, we, okay, so I kind of understand the bit you were going for, but the bit is not very heroic or fun. So let's just dump it right away. Um, so you can see they're a year they're a year and a half in, and they're already just dumping it. Um, so uh, it cuts in on this Thor 378. Uh, Iceman was there and he got his powers amped up by Loki. He ends up having to wear this like, well at the time it would have been W. Okay, so I really need to apologize to Cena Grace. <laughs> it's that, those are those are goo goo eyes. Those are definitely definitely goo goo. Oh my gosh. Um, so uh, uh, no comment right there. Um, so anyway. Again, tons of subplots, tons of references to other books. You know, sometimes they give you the reference, and sometimes you're just supposed to kind of understand this weird, wonky, reverse Ghostbusters thing. But I'm telling you, like, 22 pages. I forgot how much entertainment. It's you would think like two extra pages doesn't mean a difference, but it does. Somebody in the comments they were talking about the uh, the the Simpsons and longtime writers who had worked there. And I guess originally, way back in the day, it had been like 25-minute episodes. And they said, you know, our plots tended to run out at like 20 or 22 minutes. Um, and then we would just kind of have to vamp and throw in some like non sequitures and just random silliness. And it's not quite enough for a subplot. Uh, but like one or two extra scenes to make up that extra three minutes. And then they started adding more and more advertising. And then they started cutting our minutes back. And now we actually don't have enough. Then we have to squeeze stuff in. So I just feel like 22 pages was like the perfect, perfect um, story length for a single issue. You can get all kind. Of, you can get a main plot. You can get multiple subplots in. You can get references to other uh, issues, and it's all just really, uh, really good. Again, to explain this would basically involve me explaining every other <laughs> X book at the time as well as going back about three to seven years. So to review it, it's the introduction of Richter, who ended up being part of the New Mutants and then part of X-Force. And he's, uh, he's being introduced as a... Uh, this is a great scene where um, they think that uh, Warren Worthington Angel has uh, committed suicide. Um, so uh, basically, he's just cracking up. Like, he's remembering all the people who died, and, and then uh, Walt Simons just draws them as kind of like statue phantoms, and then some of the kids see it, and they're just like, yeah, oh, he's cracking up. And then, okay, so this is, they cut to Fallen Angels, which was, Fallen Angels was like my no moss point. Uh, even when I was kind of going and tracking down all the kind of cool, I flipped through it a bunch of times. I think I read, it, it, it wasn't good. Um, but we're seeing some of the uh, Cameron Hodge subplot of he's you know he's uh, blackmailing them and getting all this uh, uh, information on them. There's this <laughs> weird guy named Artie who uh, basically he invented memes kind of like that. He would communicate in images. Uh, although I thought it was funny that like someone's face with the crossed out. They're like, what does that mean? Um, they actually had a pretty cool uh, ship. Although they fly it there and then they just like chuck a helicopter out of the side of it. There's a lot of the thing I talk about where you can cover up stuff that's missing in the drawing, in the dialogue. So it, I would assume that they were shooting machine guns, but they're like, they just launched uh, rockets. Can you take care of them telepathically? And it's like, I got them. Scott crashed them into the bay. It's like, but okay. <laughs> we never actually saw that happen. I mean, they just went wherever. Um, and then, uh, oh, one thing I did like is this looks like just straight up they just killed him. It, there was no G.I. Joe people jumping out with helicopter with parachutes because later some police helicopters, I think Walt just really wanted to draw helicopters. There's a, there's a lot of helicopters in this thing. Then the police have these attack helicopters. <laughs> I, I love how the idea of like uh, super liberal uh, San Francisco in the 1980s <laughs> just had freaking... <laughs> Cobra gunships just at the ready. So this is obviously Walt told his wife, the writer, "Hey, uh, I really like drawing helicopters. Can we get a lot of helicopters?" And then she's, uh, it, it almost feels like passive aggressive. It's like, "Oh, you want to draw helicopters? 
Oh, I'm just supposed to cram helicopters in this story. Fine, there's like ten helicopters in there. He's like, okay, I won't ask. I won't do any special requests again. But overall, just a freaking uh, fantastic <laughs> Jean Grey looking like Tawny Katane. Uh, just fantastic, fun, entertaining. This is the original trade dress. So this says June of 1987, which means it would have come out in probably April. Why? Because it would come out in April, June. When it came out on the stands, it was returnable. If you didn't sell it, if it was a bad book, thinking of one you know current year writer in particular if your book didn't sell and if no one wanted it the uh the people at the you know the 7-eleven they would rip the cover off and then they would send the covers back they're like hey we didn't sell this uh, and then the books that were left over were called remainder and i guess like in the east coast like the mob actually sold remaindered comics um that was one of their rackets uh but um so then if it didn't sell you give it like a month or so to then when it is june then the people are like okay it's june this thing didn't sell rip the cover off and then send it to the distributor not marvel the distributor and then they get credit for it so um <laughs> this is a weird one where it's like don't go check it out um but uh i am actually going to try to find this era so what it was is it was before oh, i think they got a, i think they got the no, no, I saw it when I was trying to find a good cover image. But So there was the reverse Ghostbusters era, which flamed out pretty fast. And then they had the Fall of the Mutants. And then they had, I forget, I think they were just another mutant team. And I th actually thought that was pretty good. Fall of the Mutants is pretty intense. Uh, Fall of the Mutants and Inferno especially. That's when this team like really, really gelled. So anyway, thanks for watching. Subscribe. Make sure you're still subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. Thanks to everyone given to the GoFundMe and the Indiegogo. You're funding original content and an original lawsuit. And I will have, uh, uh, I think I'm gonna try to watch that Watchmen today. And if I miss it, I don't know. Can you can you buy like a HBO show if you missed it and you wanna watch it the next day? Whatever, I'll, I'll try. It looks to be pretty cringe and terrible and very, very current year, but I'll try it. Thanks for watching, bye.